Hello, I'm Luis Serrano and this is Serrano Academy and today I'm going to tell you how to use the discrete Fourier transform to detect if a sequence is periodic and to find its period. Why is this important? Well, for example, in things like Shor's algorithm for factoring large numbers and breaking cryptographic systems, there's a point where you have a really long sequence and the key is to find its period. So for this, we use the DFT. As a matter of fact, we use the quantum DFT. So I'm also going to show you what the quantum DFT is in a future video. But in this one, we're going to look at how the DFT can detect the period of a sequence. Are you ready? Let's begin. So this over here is the formula for the Fourier transform. It looks complicated, but in this video over here, we go over it in detail. However, I'm going to give you a very, very quick summary of the other video. Let's say we have a sequence four, three, two, one. That's our example. And we're going to find the discrete Fourier transform of the sequence. So we put some horizontal bars starting from the origin of lengths four, three, two, and one. And then we're going to look at the point at the very end. So that's this point over here. Now we're going to rotate everything 90 degrees. And so we're going to rotate the first bar 90 degrees then the second one and then the third one and we get a point over here we record the points that we've been getting then we're going to rotate everything 180 degrees so starting from the first joint then the second and then the third and we end up over here and then finally we're going to rotate everything 270 degrees so we end up over here and why did we rotate with these angles because the sequence has length four so the angles are multiple of 90 which is 360 divided by four. So now that we have these four points, we look at them in order. This is a point 10, this is a point two minus two i, because we're looking at the complex plane. So basically two is the horizontal and then minus two is the vertical. So everything with an i is vertical and that's the square root of minus one. This is gonna be a two and this is gonna be two plus two i. So we look at them in the order that we obtain them. And that is the discrete Fourier transform of four, three, two, one. It's 10, two minus two i, two and two plus two i. There's something called the inverse discrete Fourier transform, which is pretty intuitive. If you're going to rotate clockwise to get the Fourier transform, then you simply rotate counterclockwise to get the inverse discrete Fourier transform. The formulas are over here. And here's the part where you rotate clockwise or counterclockwise. And then you also divide by n. So basically, if I plug in a sequence into the discrete Fourier transform, I get another sequence. If I plug that into the inverse discrete Fourier transform, then I get the original sequence back. So as I mentioned before in this video, I will show you how to use the DFT to determine if a sequence is periodic and what's its period. So a periodic sequence is one that repeats itself. Here's an example of a non-periodic sequence, one, two, three, four, five, six. It doesn't repeat itself, so it's not periodic. However, this one over here, one, two, three, one, two, three is periodic with period three because each block that repeats itself is of length three. And this one over here, one, two, one, two, one, two is periodic with period two because it's a bunch of blocks of length two and the blocks are exactly the same. You could say that the first one is periodic with period six. It's not gonna matter very much, we could say it, but we're just gonna choose to say that it's not periodic. But sometimes we're just gonna find that the period is six and that just means it's not periodic because the period is the length of the sequence. Now, when we calculate the DFT for all of these, and I did this using Python, we get these numbers over here. Now, I invite you to pause the video and take a look at how the DFT looks like and see if there's a pattern that could tell us if the sequence is periodic or not. And the key is looking at the zeros. So let me specify when things are not zero and zero. And now you can see that when something's periodic, it has a bunch of blocks with a leading non-zero and a bunch of zeros. As a matter of fact, that's not true. The gray ones could be zero or non-zero. So I'm just gonna call them star for anything. Those are gonna be the pivots and then everything else that is actually a zero, it's gonna be in a black square. So let's look at a bigger example to really see what the DFT of a periodic sequence looks like. Let's look at this example, 3141 repeated three times, so it's got period four. And we're gonna see that because the sequence has period four, then the DFT is gonna consist of four blocks, each one of them with a pivot, and the rest are zeros. So let's see why this is the case. First, let's study what's the DFT of the first block. The first block is 3141, so we're gonna do it very quickly. The first element is easy because we rotate zero degrees, so we're basically concatenating four rods of length 3141, and the total length is nine. That is always the sum of the elements of the sequence. Next, we rotate 90 degrees, so we get this over here, and we end up one unit to the left over we started so that's a minus one next we rotate 180 degrees so we get this over here 
and we ended up five units to the right where we started so that's a five and finally for the 270 degree one this one's easy because it's very similar to the 90 degree one except flipped upside down and so we get a minus one again so the dft of 3141 is nine minus one five one now let's see what happens when we repeat this sequence several times what's going to happen with the dft and you're going to see that what's going to happen is that we're going to have four blocks because the original sequence, the base sequence 3141 has four elements. So we're going to end up with four blocks. And what's going to be the leading number, the pivot in each one of them? Well, it's going to be this nine minus 151, but not exactly. We have to multiply them by three because there's three blocks. So we get 27 minus three, 15 and minus three. And those are the leading pivots of each one of the blocks. And then everything else on the blocks is going to be zero. And that's the DFT of that original sequence. But let me convince you that this is the case and I'm gonna do it twice. First, I'm gonna do it using the DFT and then the inverse DFT. And they're both very pretty. So to remind you, we have three blocks of four on the original sequence and four blocks of three in the DFT. So let's forget what they are and let's calculate them one by one. And don't worry, I'm not gonna do the whole 12, but I'm gonna do enough for us to actually see a pattern. So let's start with the zero degree rotation. First, let's look at the first four numbers, 3141, and we know that that gives us these four rods over here of length 3141. Now, for the next block, we just simply attach a rod that is exactly the same at the end of this one. And then the same thing for the third block. So we end up with 12 rods like this. Each set of four consecutive rods has length nine, so therefore the total length is going to be 27, which is nine times three. So that's the pivot. But now let's see why this one's gonna be zero. So we're gonna have to rotate 30 degrees because we have 12 numbers in our sequence and 360 divided by 12 is 30. So let's start with the first block. The first block that gives us this over here. Now for the next four, you can imagine that it's gonna look a lot like this one, but it's gonna be rotated. By how many degrees? Well by 30 times four, which is 120 degrees. So we simply rotate this 120 degrees and we attach it to the end of the first one. And that's the result of the second block. The third block is the same thing, except rotated 120 degrees again. And now we end up with a polygon that closes. So we ended up where we started, which means that this is a zero. And that's why things are zero here. Now let's do one more to convince ourselves. This is 60 degrees. So when we rotate 60 degrees, the first block gives us this, then the next block is going to give us something like this, except rotated 60 times four, because every rod gets rotated 60 degrees, and now we're by the fifth one, so we have to rotate it 60 times four, which is 240 degrees. And then for the final block, we rotate it 240 degrees again, and voila, we ended up where we started again, so this is zero. Now let's look at why the next one is not zero, because it seems like we're getting a lot of zeros here. Why is this one not zero? Well, when we rotate 90 degrees, then check out what happens. The first four rods give us this. Now the next four rods give us something very similar, except we have to rotate it. How much? Well, 90 degrees times four, which is 360 degrees, which is like not rotating. So we didn't really rotate it, we simply concatenate it. And now we do the same thing again for the last block. We rotate it 360 degrees, which is like not rotating it, and then we concatenate it. And we ended up three spots to the left of where we started. So that's a minus three here. So this pivot here is a minus three, not a zero. However, the next one you can guess that it's gonna be a zero. I'm gonna draw it quickly. Here are the first four elements, then the next four, and then the next four. And since it's the same copy rotated and rotated again, then we end up where we started. So it's a zero. And for the next one, let me again do it quickly. This is 150. So these are the first four, the next four, and that final four and we end up where we started because of the same triple rotation that we did before so we end up here at zero but the next one is not going to be zero because what happens we have this four over here that ends up being five away from where we started then we have the four again and then we have the four again because here we didn't really rotate right we rotated 180 times four which is again 720 degrees which is like doing two full rotations which is like not rotating at all so if we don't rotate at all we don't necessarily end up at zero we may end up at zero by luck but the only places where we know we're gonna end up at zero are when we're rotating some angle. So here we ended up at 15 because that's five times three. So I hope I've done enough examples to convince you that everything where you 
rotate some angle that's not a multiple of 360 degrees you end up with some weird polygon that closes back to zero because it ends where you started but when I rotated a multiple of 360 degrees, then I simply concatenated three things and multiplied that result by three. It could still be zero by luck, but is not forced to be zero. And so now let's look. When we did 3141, the DFT was nine minus one, five minus one. So to get the one on the right, you simply multiply everything by three. So actually I like to see it as a histogram. Here's a histogram of nine, minus one, five, and minus one. And if I blow this up by three in every single direction, the horizontal and the vertical, then take a look. I have 27, zero, zero, minus three, zero, zero, 15, zero, zero, and minus three, zero, zero, because I stretch it to the right. So my pivots are no longer zero, one, two, three. Now they are zero, three, six, and nine. And the heights are also multiplied by three because I don't have nine minus one, five minus one. I have 27 minus three, 15 and minus three. So this is for this example, but I'm sure you're seeing what happens in general. If I have a sequence that repeats many times, let's say it's of length capital N, which is M times K, where the period is K, means that each one of the blocks has length K and there's M of them. If I were to apply the DFT, then I'm gonna get a bunch of blocks, each one of them with a pivot that could be zero or non-zero but the rest of the things in the block are zero. The length is n equals mk, where now I have k blocks of length m. And each block has one pivot, could be any value, and m minus one zeros. Now here's a small word of warning. Let's say I got confused and I look at this sequence. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And this is obviously something of period two because it's the block one two repeated many times but i could get confused and see this as one two one two one two one two and then one two one two which now has period four or i could even get more confused and think it has period six because i have two blocks that are one two one two one two or i could just be so confused and think this has period 12. Obviously for a short sequence like this, it's not gonna happen, but imagine having a really, really, really long sequence. It's plausible that you may end up getting confused and not seeing the period, or maybe seeing a multiple of the period. That doesn't matter. But now what happened with the discrete Fourier transform? Where do we get confused here? Well, take a look. For the first one, we have two blocks with pivots 18 and minus six. For the second one, we have four blocks, except that some of the pivots are zero. For the third one, we have six blocks and some of the pivots are zero. And for the last one, well, we just have a bunch of pivots. Every block is just a pivot. So sometimes it's not obvious from the DFT what the actual period is because some zeros may confuse you. So this is something to definitely keep an eye on. So as I mentioned before, I was gonna show you two reasons why the DFT of a periodic sequence looks like the blocks in the bottom. And the second one is flipping them around and using the inverse DFT instead of the DFT. So if you recall that inverse DFT is calculated in the same way as DFT, except instead of rotating clockwise, you rotate counterclockwise, and then you divide by the total number of entries, which is 12. Now, just to compare, I'm gonna look at the sequence of pivots, which is 27 minus 315 and minus three. I'm not gonna divide it by three, and we're gonna do the inverse DFT of that one. We're gonna calculate them at the same time. So let's look at the first entry, which is k equals zero. Here we do no rotations. So we are going to concatenate a bunch of rods. The first rod is of length 27. Then I have two rods of length zero, which is I'm doing nothing. Then I have a rod of length minus three, which goes in the opposite direction because it's a negative number. Then two rods of no length, so they don't do anything. Then a rod of length 15, then two rods of length zero, and then a rod of length minus three, which goes to the left. So the concatenation of these ones ends at the point 36 because the sum of 27 minus 3, 15 and minus three is 36. And as you can see in the right, the sequence of four numbers, the same thing happens, except that we don't have all those pesky zeros. Now let's do it for k equals one. That's the second entry on the inverse DFT. Well, what happens here? Let me put the degrees on top of each element in the sequence. So we're gonna be rotating a multiple of these degrees from zero all the way to 330. And so take a look at the dials. This is how much we're gonna be rotating each one of the rods. And then we do the same thing on the sequence on the right. So we have other angles, which are zero, 90, 180, and 270. And I'm sure if you look at it, you're gonna see that we're gonna end up with the same thing, but let's do it slowly. The first rod is of length 27. Then we have two rods of length zero then a rod of length minus three rotated 90 degrees, but that's going down because it's negative. It really should go up because we're going clockwise for the inverse DFT, but it goes down because it's negative. Then 
one of length 15 and then one of length minus 3. So we end up at 12. So that goes on both of the inverse DFTs. Now let's do k equals 2. So look at the dials and this is how much we're going to rotate. We're going to rotate 2 times 30 degrees for each one of them. So a rod of length 27, then two rods of length 0, then a rod of length minus 3. So it should go to the left, but it's rotated 180 degrees. So it goes to the right. Then two rods of length 0, then a rod of length 16, and then again a rod of length minus 3 rotated 180 degrees times 3, which is still 180. And we end up at 48. So 48 is the next number. Now bear with me, we just have to do one more. And that's k equals 3. And that's going to look a lot like k equals 1, except turned upside down. So a rod of length 27, two rods of length 0, a rod of length minus 3, two rods of length 0, one of length 15, two of length 0, and then one of length minus 3. And just like at k equals 1, we end up at 12. So 12 is the fourth element. Now, as you can see, we are done with the sequence on the right, but we're not done with the sequence on the left. However, what happens if we do one more? So k equals 4. Well, take a look at the dials. We're going to rotate 30 more degrees over here. And now let's forget about the zeros. Since we're not adding anything, let's actually remove those dials and take a look at the ones that are left. All of them are zero because we did one full loop. So the zeros, who cares how many degrees they're rotated? The pivots have already all been rotated 360 degrees a number of times. So when we want the entry for k equals 4, we're going to get the same entry as k equals 0. And the same thing for k equals 5 and 1, 6 and 2, and 7 and 3. So basically we get a copy of the first four numbers because we already rotated everything 360 degrees and we're back to where we started. And now for the remaining numbers, 8, 9, 10, and 11, for the same reason, we again get a copy of 36, 12, 48, and 12. And now remember that because of the inverse DFT, we divide everything by 12, so we get 3141, 3141, 3141. So if we start with a sequence of blocks like the one on top with a pivot and then some lengths are zero and apply the inverse DFT, then we get a periodic sequence. And just for completion, let's look at the one on the right and divide by four to get nine, three, 12, three. So I hope I've convinced you using the DFT and the inverse DFT that the DFT of a sequence is a very particular sequence of blocks. And that's all folks. Thank you very much. If you like this video, please make sure to subscribe to get more similar videos or hit like or share amongst your friends or comment. I really like to see your comments. You can also tweet at me at Serrano Academy. You can check my page, which is serrano.academy, where there's a lot of videos, information, blog posts, etc. And if you like this material, you should also check out my book. It's called Grokking Machine Learning. And in the links, you'll find a discount code of 40%. So thank you very much and see you in the next video.